Thank you guys for having me. I am one of the faculty at University of Maryland. I am actually an emergency physician and neurointensivist, so I did a neurocritical care fellowship. And so I split my time between the ED and ICU. One of my interests is, of course, trying to make neurotopics a little bit more manageable, easily understanding, um, things like that for our residents, as well as, of course, for EM physicians uh, in general. So this is going to be a little bit in terms of back to the basics, but hopefully I can break down acute non-traumatic weakness for you guys and you guys can take away some pearls you can use on your next shift. So no disclosures and really we're going to be talking a lot about like I mentioned the basics. History and physical is the key to a lot of what we see in the ED including for neurological complaints and you're going to see that really you can get a lot of information and help narrow down this Y differential you initially have when somebody presents with weakness uh, just by the history and physical. And we'll talk a little bit about how to manage a few of the, uh, the non-traumatic weakness uh, processes that you guys might see in the ED less so than the typical ones such as stroke, et cetera, that I think all of us see pretty regularly and are pretty comfortable with that. And so hopefully at the end, you guys will take away um, the point that there is truth in doing a thorough history and physical. And again, we'll go through some pearls and how to do that, specifically for this particular complaint. In terms of specific to the two disease processes we'll mention, which is Guillain-Barre and myasthenia gravis, you're going to hear a little bit about how we try and figure out, how, uh, you know, neurologically uh, mediated respiratory failure in these patients are one of the biggest emergencies we're worried about in the ED. And so bedside pulmonary function tests are actually helpful in Guillain-Barre, but not much in myasthenia. But um, the myasthenic patients, if you do get them early enough and are aggressive enough using even non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, you can potentially avoid intubation in these patients. All right, so you pick up a chart and it's weak, weakness, and you're probably groaning inside. I do it too, it's okay. And just like if you were to pick up a chart that says dizzy, right? What about weekend dizzy? You're like, all right, I'm done. Can I put this chart back? Um, and so I think a lot of us react this way to such a complaint because the differential is wide, right? There are neurological causes, there are medical causes, and you have to do a neurological exam to try and figure out where the process is. Uh, and so, and, and oftentimes these patients are elderly, so they have a lot of comorbidities. So it really makes it hard to try and figure out what exactly is important and what exactly is an emergency and what you can send out and have them follow up as an outpatient, right? So why does it matter? Well, like I already alluded to, the, a lot of these patients who present to the ED with weakness are old. And so this older study looked at um, just the non-specific complaints that come through the ED, including weakness. And they found that the most common causes the people present that are non-specific, and by non-specific it means not your typical chest pain, abdominal pain, headache, things like that. And people present with generalized weakness, feeling exhausted, or recent falls. Those are three most common non-specific presenting complaints to the ED in a group that is quite elderly, as you can see. And a lot of these patients, up to 60%, really had a serious um, outcome in terms of within the next 30 days. And that this might be a actual life-threatening condition or something that required intervention. So when you do see a patient that presents with weakness, you doing a key, uh, being the key um, person to intervene, you might save the person from, of course, a potentially bad outcome. So this is why it's important, even though it is big and complicated. But again, I'm going to try and break it down for you guys. So we're going to start Again, back to the basics, which is with the history. And so a lot of times you start very simple. What do you mean by weak, right? And so how many of you guys have you know, had lectures on you know, dizziness and, and, and um, Dr. Newman Tokers is uh, uh, in terms of his research, et cetera, about how we're not supposed to ask, what do you mean by dizzy? Well, I would say that weakness, you may have to tease out a little bit more what patients mean, because a lot of the times they actually mean that they have malaise, meaning they just generally are not feeling well and feel a generalized weakness. You know, because again, people check in and they say they have generalized weakness. You're like, is that a neurological complaint? Is it not? Etc. 
Another reason that people can mean, say that they're weak, especially currently with our flu season, is fatigue, right? And so if you think about the word specifically fatigue, it means with repetitive actions, you actually have reduced like motor function, right? But that's not specifically what I think a patient means because when we talk about neurological weakness and we specifically talk about a weakness that gets worse, meaning fatigable weakness, that really leads you down the pathway of a neuromuscular junction problem. And so what patients tell you is one thing and you being the clinician are trying to tease out what they really mean um, in, in what they're saying. They may just present and say, I don't feel well, I don't feel right. Again, trying to tease out what they mean from it. They've had falls, etc. Why are you falling? Is it because you actually have a right-sided weakness and therefore you're falling to the right, etc.? Those are all very possible. And then you also communicate with your consultants, right? And we always want to sound intelligent when we talk to our consultants because it helps you get what you need. And so potentially when you, after you've seen the patient, you're going to have to discuss this maybe with your neurology colleagues. You're going to describe that this patient has a hemiparesis or maybe a quadriparesis, you know, or are they hemiplegic? Paresis meaning a degree of loss of function, a weakness of whatever extremity or pattern that you're describing, plegia meaning the complete zero function, right? When people are, are um, let's say, have a spinal cord injury and they are quadriplegic, that means they have no motor function at all of their arms or legs. So using the right term will help you communicate with your consultants and then right, really trying to tease out from your uh, patients in terms of what they mean by weak. All right, and in terms of the nitty gritty, you guys are familiar with this. A lot of times we do have to figure out the time course because if somebody presents and they say that, well, the patient was well up until um, you know, just an hour ago at breakfast and then suddenly had development of right side of weakness with the right facial droop, your mind is probably already thinking, okay, this could be an acute stroke, right? Because it was an acute onset, it was sudden, it matches the vascular distribution, and therefore that is high on your differential and you're gonna go down your hospital stroke protocol, et cetera, to work that up. But what about other um, descriptions of these symptoms? A lot of uh, um, other symptoms can be acute too if people actually have had, let's say, um, a generalized uh, um, viral illness that led to some development of uh, lower extremity weakness and tingling, you're probably thinking, this is sounding like you're giving me some keywords, buzzwords about Guillain-Barre. Maybe that's what I'm going down. Things that are more insidious and episodic are probably things that we are not quite going to work up in the ED. You might have to refer out and that might be things that are, you know, neoplastic related processes or sometimes it might just even be these are, this is episodes that are happening because they're random and you're thinking periodic paralysis or are these episodes that are happening that are worse at the end of the day and you're thinking really fatigable weakness again. So again, trying to tease out what do the patients mean and what is the pattern you're talking about. The distribution is important. This is going to go into a little bit more in the actual physical exam. Of course, if the patient has, quote, generalized weakness, you're f first trying to tease out are they weak at all or are they just simply having malaise and fatigue like we said a couple slides back or do they actually have localized weakness of their arm, localized weakness of their face or do they have proximal versus distal weakness that we often think about when we're trying to tease out, let's say, maybe a myopathy or may be things like uh, actually a, a spinal cord injury too. You know, central cord classically you have upper extremity weakness that's worse in terms of your distal hands as opposed to your proximal arms. So these patterns will tell you a lot more in terms of where you're going down to do your workup. Because unfortunately I think all of us don't have the luxury of doing pan MRIs just for workup of uh, weakness in a patient. And then finally, in terms of other elements of the history, what other symptoms do the patient have? If they're describing I'm weak and, I, and my, my legs are weak and they're sore, maybe you're thinking in terms of a myopathy. If you're thinking of a weakness that is one-sided with aphasia or neglect, you're really thinking maybe down the stroke pathway. 
because there's other neurological complaints that's related to the cortex you're talking about. If, you're, if somebody actually has double vision or also describes difficulty with swallowing, they're choking on their foods, etc. In addition to feeling weak in their arms or legs, you're really going to be going down the path of, okay, is this myasthenia gravis? Is this something that is a brainstem process, especially if it comes on fast? Or is this something that is a, a progressive, let's say, Guillain-Barre, et cetera. And then the, uh, these are the things you guys all remember from uh, or, or will remember for your uh, in-service and board exams, which is you know, heavy metal exposures, of course, can give you polyneuropathies, rashes, you have to think about dermatomyositis, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Only one slide on neuroanatomy, okay? Uh, because, unfortunately, trying to put the history together and figure out the pattern and the weakness means you have to figure out where exactly the actual pa uh, pathology might be. Well, I'm not, we're not asking you guys to be a neurologist to say it is exactly where, et cetera, et cetera. We're asking you to narrow it down so you know that if this is a process that's involving the brain or the spinal cord or a peripheral nerve or the neuromuscular junction. Because again, you can't can't MRI you know, a patient's entire spine and brain and then find out that this is actually probably a peripheral nerve process or a neuromuscular junction process, right? We just can't do a shotgun approach in that way. So you do need to narrow down, unfortunately, the anatomy a little bit more. So a quick refresher, like I mentioned, it is that in terms of what, what allows us to move, what is our motor pathway, it starts, of course, with your motor cortex in the brain, goes through the brain stem into your spinal cord. There's, there was lots of different um, as, you know, tracks in the spinal cord, which you guys don't have to remember, except that uh, out, as it comes out of the spinal cord is a spinal nerve. That's when, of course, you have the transition between an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. And that becomes important because part of your physical exam will try and help you differentiate what the patient's uh, uh, symptoms matches up with. Again, where does it localize to? Then you're going to have a peripheral nerve, and again, this might be something like a demyelinating process or maybe a direct co compression, let's say on uh, a, a, a nerve plexus, etc. And then finally, you have a neuromuscular junction, which um, classically we think about myasthenia gravis or maybe even something like botulism as a cause of people having neuromuscular weakness at the neuromuscular junction. And so trying to categorize it, we think about, of course, the brain and the spinal cord being upper motor neuron. We think about the, as it exits through the spinal cord into the peripheral nerve, we were talking about lower motor neuron, the neuromuscular junction I mentioned already, and then the final unit that we don't often think about in this whole motor kind of pathway is, of course, it goes to the muscle. So there are, of course, like as I already alluded to, some um, processes involving the muscle that causes weakness. Um, you might think about muscular dystrophy in those people with a history, or you might think about people who are coming in with a myopathy, dermatitis, myositis, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, what do you need to do on the neurological exam? Well, I would say a complete neurological exam, but um, really there needs to be a few components that you can't miss. So this is not the patient that comes in and you say, okay, grossly normal, uh, intact, you know, no focal deficit. Because if they are truly complaining of weakness, you're gonna have to do a little bit more detail in terms of you know, how does that particular extremity they're complaining about weakness, how does each of the isolated muscle groups test out, that way you can explain yourself and say, I don't think this is a problem involving the spinal cord or the brain, therefore I don't need to do a workup, I can discharge a patient. And so you do have to look in terms of doing a more thorough exam. The reason you have to do some cranial nerve exams is because we're trying to figure out if this weakness is associated with bulbar dysfunction that we classically think of with myasthenia gravis, or if somebody has, let's say again, right side of weakness with a right facial droop, you're going to try and localize that to something that is in the brain above the spinal cord because it involves the face. String testing, as I mentioned, isolated muscle groups. Reflexes, we'll talk about in a little bit. How many of you guys are comfortable doing reflexes? Okay. How many of you guys have a reflex hammer? <laughs> 
Stethoscope, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know, I just wanted to check my residents too. Um, so yes, please, uh, when people have weaknesses, we do have to do reflexes. It doesn't have to be on everybody, uh, as we'll talk about some caveats to it. Specifically, when you are going down the path of worrying about something like myasthenia gravis, you have to demonstrate, do they have fatigable weakness? You know, do their arms drift down with time? You know, do they have worsening ptosis when you're having them look up uh, with a sustained kind of gaze, etc. You're going to also make a notice of, of course, of their muscle tone or if they have any fasciculations because this is a component where it helps you figure out if it's an upper motor neuron or a lower motor neuron process. And then sensation is important because especially if you're worried about a neuropathy or a, a plexopathy or a spinal cord process, you're going to try, that's going to help you figure out, you know, is there a pattern with the weakness and the sensory deficits they're complaining of. Okay. A quick review, this should be a review for everybody. The motor score, there is a reason we use it because it's consistent. And when I talk about isolated muscle group testing, you know, I think all of us do a good job testing upper extremities because we'll have people push pull, we'll have people, you know, do even wrist extensions, you'll even have people do deltoids. You know, you're good at testing those things. But I find that unfortunately my residents, I don't know about you guys, don't tend to do as good of a job in lower extremities isolated testing because we examine them on the bed and we do take care of a lot of patients who are obese and maybe older and less mobile so can they really even resist when you ask them to lift up their leg some of them can't right and so you're gonna have to isolate and check and see are they able to hip flex are they able to you know knee extend when you actually support their thigh you know etc cetera, etc cetera. that way you can sort out is there proximal or distal weakness in the lower extremities the reflexes, he is a refresher. A reflex is said is two plus is normal. Less than that is the, of course, decreased reflexes. Higher than that is um, increased reflexes. I think the key part that I want to point out is a very easy thing you guys can do is check for clonus. You know, sometimes you guys, uh, you know, might be checking a Babinski or et cetera in some patients and you can check for clonus and you already have an answer if somebody is hyperreflexic. The classic um, case that I can think of that you guys would see in the ED, a patient who has has clonus is somebody who has serotonin syndrome and so next time you see a patient that you're going down the differential to figure out is it serotonin syndrome is it um, uh, malignant hyperthermia etc check and see if the person is hyperreflexic and has a clonus okay all right, I alluded to this that, you know, we talk about we can differentiate upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron based on looking at people's reflexes as well as their muscle tone and then the Babinski. And so this uh, should be a refresher for all of us, which is that, you know, in the upper motor neuron process, so if you think about somebody who has a history of a stroke and they come in, they're a little contracted and they're spastic in that arm and leg and they also have increased reflexes in in that old stroke site. The reason I say an old stroke is because when they c present acutely, they don't have that, right? And you don't see it. So this is unfortunately tough because we see acute processes and this doesn't help us. So I would say that the only thing that helps us when we're thinking about the general differentiation between upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron is whether or not you can definitively say if somebody has a process that matches a lower motor neuron. Okay, so again, the classic case would be somebody who comes in with ascending paralysis, so a reflexic flaccid paralysis, that's ascending, I'm giving you guys all these buzzwords, because, you know, and that you go down the pathway of thinking that's Guillain-Barre, and so that is when it's helpful. Okay. A lot of neurology is um, pattern recognition. That's a lot of medicine. That's a lot of what we do in emergency medicine in general, right? You, with experience, you recognize a pattern, it helps you fit into a box, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you're trying to figure out where um, this particular lesion could be, it is trying to think of everything in that context. So I'm gonna give you a broad way to think about this and let me know if it helps make, it makes sense to you guys. We're gonna simply talk about unilateral 
versus bilateral weakness, okay? This lecture is on acute weakness. We're not talking about anything that is not acute. So we're breaking it down to acute unilateral weakness and an acute bilateral weakness. Okay, I put the diagram on the side because I wanted you guys to try and think of it as we could talk through some um, patterns of presentations to try and localize it. And so, the first scenario is you have acute unilateral, well, the first thing I did was I crossed out the neuromuscular junction, which is there's no such thing as acute unilateral weakness with a neuromuscular junction process, because you can't just only have a process involving one extremity's neuromuscular junction. So that makes it easy. You're only dealing with three major um, kind of areas when you're talking about unilateral weakness. Okay. so. The first question is when the patient comes in, you're trying to do a general neurological exam as you're looking for cortical signs. Then this might be asking if the patient understands, can follow commands, tell us, tell you your name, et cetera, et cetera. Because if the patient has aphasia or neglect or apraxia, things like that, they have other cortical signs, right? And this is how you classically think of those people with um, the classic MCA strokes, et cetera. Now, obviously see not every stroke comes with cortical signs because you can get patients with basal ganglia strokes or internal capsule strokes, a subcortical stroke. The, the, the catchphrase is the pure motor stroke, right? You only affect your motor um, findings. And so this, uh, those patients, you're just looking to see if they have any other symptoms with it. They may not have sensory symptoms with it. They may not have other patterns that isolates to, let's say, a spinal level, a dermatome, etc. And so they, it's still an extremity weakness, a one-sided weakness that fits into a stroke. So cortical signs plus acute unilateral weakness, you're thinking something that's in the brain and we have to worry about something like a stroke. Okay, before we move further, oh, actually next thing, the face as I already alluded to, it's helpful because the face, uh, in terms of cranial nerve uh, 7, uh, is uh, uh, of course above the spinal cord. So whenever you have a, a facial involvement plus other weakness, extremity weakness, you know that you're dealing with a process that's above the spinal cord. Make sense? Okay. All right, before we move further, the reason I left the spinal cord diagram up there is that although classically when you have any sort of spinal cord pathology, a myelopathy that is from, let's say, a herniated disc or maybe transverse myelitis, an inflammatory um, you know, process involving the spinal cord at multiple levels, you're going to have bilateral involvement, right? The only the thing that doesn't quite fit that is only if you have a hemi-core transaction, right? So it doesn't quite fit because we're not talking about traumatic uh, weaknesses, but I just wanted you guys to think that, again, unilateral weakness can involve everything from the brain, the core, to the peripheral nerve. Okay. The next thing is, okay, you've talked about the brain, then everything else comes down to dermatomes, myotomes. It's okay. You can Google it and see if it matches up with the patient, right? And so what you do is you examine the patient clear, you know, in detail, and you think, okay, I had weakness in these areas, I had sensory deficits in these areas, you know, I had my reflexes are high, uh, you know, increased or decreased, okay, let me go back to my computer, see if I can fit it into a dermatome or a myotome. And this is how you can figure out, you know, if somebody has a process that's involving the spinal cord. Or maybe a process that is only involving the arm and you're thinking of brachial plexopathy. You know, those things that happen. And so use your uh, resources uh, uh, as friends. Okay. And then finally, if it doesn't fit in terms of a process involving the brain, the spinal cord, a plexus, then you're really left with a peripheral nerve, right? And how can you get a peripheral nerve? Well, you can get an isolated radial nerve palsy, right, et cetera, Saturday night palsy, things like that. And so again, if your symptoms matches it, only isolated trouble with, you know, the patient only has a wrist drop, et cetera, right? And so this is, again, isolated detail testing and helps you narrow it down. Okay, the more complicated and the bigger differential is when people have acute bilateral 
uh, weakness. And that can be anywhere in this whole neuroanatomy scheme. But again, let's talk a little bit about how are some of the patterns that you can recognize to figure out what's going on. So the only way you can get a change in your mental status and bilateral weakness is somebody has a bad process involving the brain, right? And so this is somebody who is a big um, ICH with, you know, mass effect, etc. That's why their mental status is depressed. Um, but uh, to have bilateral weakness, then you're talking about something with significant midline shift or maybe a basilar occlusion. Right? These patients are the ones that comes in comatose. You're like, ah, they're not doing anything. You know, but when you do their actual neurological exam testing, you find cranial nerve deficits as well as that they're not really moving their arms and legs. And so you might be worried about a basilar occlusion in the right context of things. Next, you're going to try to figure out, is this something that involves the arms or the legs? Well, because I already also alluded to this, which is when you're talking about the spinal cord, well, classically, when you have anything that's involving your cervical cord, of course, you could have of arms and leg involved. And so quadriparesis um, and or or in this in the in in the category of central cord, you might have more arm than leg involvement. The, um, the vice versa, meaning if you have thoracic or lumbar cord processes, of course, you're going to have leg involvement, no arm involvement. So that helps you sort out a little bit of that. Sensory levels, bladder involvement, whenever you have the combination of all those together, then you're thinking cord, 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 right? Um, so my question for you guys is, is cauda equina an upper motor neuron or a lower motor neuron process? Lower, correct. So, so remember your spinal cord already ended, your conus, and then you have your nerve roots that are floating in there. That's the, that's the nerve root that's compressed. And so it is a loader motor neuron process. And when you do have that, these patients will then present with decreased reflexes in addition to the concerning uh, you know, compilation of symptoms of weakness, uh, uh, paresthesia, decreased sensation, bowel bladder involvement, et cetera, okay? Okay, next, after you've ruled out the spinal cord, you're going to try and figure out proximal versus distal muscle involvement. And so this is um, in somebody who, that you're trying to figure out. The, the classic um, story is somebody who has trouble combing their hair, somebody who has trouble you know, getting out of a, a seat. Um, and so they might also complain of weakness in addition to muscle aches. So that's going to really go down the path of myopathies, right? Ball bar signs, I've already alluded to this. Anytime you have bilateral weakness plus ball bar signs, what do I mean by ball bar signs? These are people who have dysphagia, dysphonia, et cetera, then you're really worried about either a brainstem process or a neuromuscular junction process like myasthenia gravis. And fluctuating weakness, that even points down the neuromuscular junction even more, especially again if you have fatigable weakness. So just the schema in terms of how to think about it. Um, again, as much as uh, um, neuroanatomy isn't fun for, I think, a lot of uh, people, uh, if you do know and can work your way through it, then it's easy to fit the symptoms into a category and where you need to do more work up. You know, then you'll know I need to get an MRI of the C-spine or an MRI of the brain only or an MRI of the L-spine for cauda equina. Okay, so let's put it a little bit into practice, some cases. First case is a 29-year-old female who had four-day history of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, followed by diplopia, dysarthria, and dysphagia. Anything else you'd like to know? Huh? Is it fatigable? It is not. She says it just has been progressively getting worse. 
So I'm gonna jump and think that you were thinking of fatigable weakness possibly by the fact that this patient had things like diplopia, dysphagia, dysarthria. So I told you bulbar symptoms, worrisome for neuromuscular junctions. So you ask and test if they have fatigable weakness. All right, okay. All right, okay. As I already alluded to, you can think about the bulbar symptoms as the four Ds, dysphagia, dysarthria, dysphonia, dyspnea actually is also on there. And so these are essentially, thing, uh, essentially you're, you're affected by your cranial nerves 9 through 12. That's what gives your symptoms. Yes? Good, a good question. Does dysarthria meaning the actual mechanics of speech not coming out correctly because uh, the, the classically we talk about people who are um, or, or we often describe people or alcohol or intoxicated patient as having dysarthria because they're slurring their speech right the speech is not coming out clearly and that's a, a, a related to these muscles as more the reason for this patient so these patients have like muffled and nasally voices um, but phonation wise, they can also have a very weak voice related to actually their laryngeal muscles being weak too. Okay, cool. Awesome. And so the reason we worry about bulbar weakness and bulbar symptoms is because sometimes these patients can actually have so much pharyngeal weakness that it can collapse and lead to like, you know, transient airway obstruction. Uh, or they can have aspiration risks, of course, and, and so that is a, a concern for these patients. And that might lead you to figure out if they actually need to be intubated for airway protection, et cetera. So assessing these patients aside from cranial nerves 9 through 12, you're going to also check out the rest of the cranial nerves. And so that includes so looking for ptosis, looking for extraocular movements. And you can look and see if the patient can do a sustained up gaze. And so what you do is you say, OK, look up, look up, look up. And they keep trying to look up. But then their eyes will kind of drift down, and their ptosis will get worse. I'm describing somebody who has fatigable weakness from myasthenia and limited up gaze to do to that. They can have other weaknesses, bifacial weaknesses, and so they might have ptosis, but you actually see a lot of their eye because their lower face is actually weak, right? You see a lot more of the whites of their eyes down on the inferior portions, and we already talked about how they can have a dysphagia with that too. Okay. Another scenario might be you have uh, somebody who has a history of hypertension, CHF, COPD, who has a fever, productive cough, and dyspnea on exertion times one week. Fits our current EDs, I'm sure, right now. Uh, seen in the urgent care five days ago and given a prescription for Leviquin, and her symptoms is not getting any better. It's actually getting worse, so she comes to the ED now. So any uh, questions or anything else you'd like to know about this particular case? Okay, cool. Chest x-ray to see, you know, if the patient has worsened pneumonia, et cetera. Absolutely. Okay. All right. And so this is describing somebody who had a recent URI or pneumonia and worsening symptoms with it. And she is describing of dyspnea and potentially even orthopnea. And when you assess her, you can actually see potentially some of these other symptoms. These patients can be tachypnic, they can have broken speech. You know, we often describe our asthmatics and COPDers in terms of they can speak in few word sentences, full sentence, etc. Similarly with these particular types of patients. And you can have them count from 1 to 20 in a single breath. All of us should be able to do that. So let's do it. One breath, count one to 20. Silently. Okay. <laughs> but hopefully you guys can all do that. This is a quick bedside assessment of a patient's vital capacity. So you should be able to. As, uh, that uh, Hopefully uh, everybody's able to do that. I count at least a single breath at 1 to 20. And so these patients may not make it and you might use that as a gauge in terms of how they're doing the ED. Maybe they started by only being able to count out to 16 and then later on 14 and lower and lower. Or maybe it stays the same. You can also assess if they have any neck flexion weakness. So why would we do that? 
What did the neck muscles have to do with somebody who's complaining of dyspnea? Yeah, exactly. If you think about your respiratory muscles, of course, you're thinking about, okay, you have diaphragm, and then, of course, your intercostal muscles. And then, so, if you also assess that, yeah, the, you know, in terms of accessory muscle use. So, if somebody has weak neck flexion, that might worry you about their, the rest of their respiratory muscle strength. So, you might be, not be able to assess as easily. You can't quite measure intercostal muscle strength. You may be able to do a diaphragmatic ultrasound, now that you guys are all pros at ultrasounds, things like that. And then you might also see that they might have some paradoxical breathing, meaning abdominal breathing. And so what I'm describing here is somebody who has, oftentimes we see these in our, again, asthmatic COPDers who have uh, respiratory distress. And the specific to that, um, I, we, I, we put in a few things in assessing kind of their, their neuromuscular strength their single breath count as well as their neck flexion as a way to get a sense of do this patient have impending respiratory failure. So I was alluding to right at the beginning that oftentimes we might assess a, a bedside pulmonary function test in some of these patients with neuromuscular respiratory failure. These are your patients with uh, myasthenia gravis or Guillain-Barre. Uh, and the reason we do it is, you know, it gives you a trend, right, that you can figure out are they going down the wrong way with their single breath count and these numbers that you have to think about intubating them. But there are some caveats. The reason it's more reliable in Guillain Barre patient is Guillain Barre is a process is a disease process that is you know kind of linear right it, it can just usually it gets a little worse before it gets better etc now whereas myasthenia is a fatigable symptom so they're gonna have fluctuations and so to be able to do these tests it's very much patient effort dependent of course respiratory therapy dependent too right and so for Guillain Barre if you see that the trend is getting worse then you know they have respiratory impending respiratory failure, they need to be intubated, etc. With the myasthenic, trending it is just not as reliable. On top of that, if people actually have, let's say, facial weakness um, and they can't really get the seal around the apparatus, then they can't really do the test well. And so I, th usually we would only do this really for the patients who with Guillain-Barre. So some cutoffs that you might remember or may remember for your in-service and board exam is the 20-30-40 rule. If you have a forced vital capacity that's less than 20 cc's per kilo, a negative inspiratory force that's less than 30 centimeters of water, or we rarely do the maximal expiratory pressure, but if you were to do that less than 40, then these people have essentially impending respiratory failure and need to be intubated. Okay. All right. Well, what about an ABG or VBG? We often use that maybe, I don't know about you guys' practices, maybe as a gauge of our sicker asthmatic or COPD years to see how their CO2 retention is doing. But the trouble with people who have neuromuscular respiratory failure is that they've been trying to compensate for a long time, right? They already have weakness that is progressive, they're tachypnic, their breath, breath volumes are much smaller, and so they're not gonna really reflect in ABG until it's way too late. So we don't tend to use this as a way to indicate if somebody needs intervention right there. Their clinical symptoms and their progression, how fast it is, the trend they are doing, is going to give you the most information. Okay. And then another scenario is you have a 22-year-old uh, male who has shortness of breath and uh, initially had an onset of back pain and since then has had numbness, weakness, and tingling of his legs and arms. Anything else you'd like to know about his case? Symmetric. symmetric, yeah, it is symmetric. And so this uh, um, has been progressive, started in his legs, now involving his arms. Oh, okay, great. Um, he would say, now that you mentioned it, I do feel like, you know, I'm not going to the bathroom as much, but when I do, yeah, it seems like I have to wait and try and pee it out a lot more. Hmm? Recent illness. Yeah, I had a diarrheal event, you know, two weeks ago. 
Uh, it is not. He just notices that it has been affecting his legs and then his arms. Yeah. Okay, cool. You guys are asking all the right questions from our initial part of the discussion. Okay, so specific to this particular case, you guys are probably going down the pathway of Guillaume Barre. Um, the fact that Guillaume Barre can affect, of course, your peripheral nerves in many ways, polyneuropathy, it can also affect your autonomic system, right? And so these people can actually have dysautonomia in terms of extreme hypertension, hypotension, tachycardia, bradycardia. Sometimes it makes managing these patients really difficult, especially if you're talking about needing to intubate them, et cetera. And you might be titrating drips in terms of lycardipine with a levofed at the same time. So just being aware. It doesn't come on right away. Usually it's about a week into a disease course, but again, these people usually have a progressive worsening symptoms so they don't really come to the ER until a couple of days into their symptoms because at the very beginning they're just saying oh, I have some you know tingling pain and then they notice some weakness and then the symptoms progress and so that's something to consider and uh, related to that they can have urinary retention ileus etc which compounds the parasympathetic effect that you know when you actually have retention and ileus can give you Okay, so a little bit about the three cases and how we manage it. So the first case we talked about abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting with some um, um, bulbar symptoms and also has some uh, mouth dryness and constipation and ate some home canned vegetables. So what is this? Botulism. Okay, we don't see this often, um, but if you were to see a patient like this, you might notice that they have bilateral ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, uh, bifacial weakness, upper extremity weakness, and absent um, reflexes. Essentially, you have a toxin that inhibits the release of your acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, and this is classically described as a descending paralysis. Okay, well, again, bored, easy stuff. Um, respiratory failure can uh, occur off pretty fast because guess what? You have less <laughs> nerves to go through before you get to uh, your actual respiratory muscles. Um, and you want to avoid things like magnesium citrate as well as sulfate because those, those can worsen in terms of the, the neuromuscular weakness that these patients have. Okay? All right. The second case, we talked about a recent URI or pneumonia treated with Leviquin, but had worsening of the symptoms. And maybe in front of you, the, they actually have uh, also bilateral ptosis, inability to sustain up gaze, fatigability, and then also a paradoxical breathing pattern. So what is this? Myasthenia? Yeah. Okay, and so the reason we talk about uh, myasthenia specifically with this case is that, well, first as a reminder, you have an antibody to your postsynaptic neuromuscular junction, so your acetylcholine just simply can't bind, and that's why you have these symptoms. You treat it by giving more acetylcholine, like uh, or peridostigmine is what these patients are on at home, so that they have more to try and um, act at the neuromuscular junction. The very key point is fatigable weakness, right? Because as you're you, you, um, activating those junctions, you're going to have less and less in terms of acetylcholine to work. And so this is the pathognomonic for myasthenia. Regardless of whether it goes, involves more of the bulbar um, mus uh, muscles and symptoms or more peripheral symptoms, the whole myasthenia versus Lambert-Eaton thing. Just remember fatigable weakness. Why is it important in what we do? Well, because a lot of things um, in terms of myasthenic crisis is we do to them, right? Unfortunately, there's too many medications that can exacerbate the, um, these, uh, these patients. Most commonly, it is from an antibiotic because they had a recent upper respiratory illness. They get put on one, and then they end up having a crisis. The one caveat is that uh, you know patients with a known diagnosis and a long history of myasthenia, they're actually really aware of how to manage manage their symptoms, so when they find that their weakness is getting worse, they might increase their peridostigmine, and then you end up having a cholinergic crisis because too much uh, um, of uh, acetylcholine in that way, and also leading to a lot of symptoms. So um, you have to figure out your kind of dumbbells, et cetera, way to figure out whether somebody's having a cholinergic crisis or a myasthenia crisis. 
Another thing I want to point out is corticosteroids. Oftentimes we use steroids to treat myasthenia. And so these patients um, to, who are treated with steroids will actually get worse before they get better. And these are often the patients who more, uh, are more necessary to be admitted to a higher level of care, specifically for that reason. Yes? Cool. You guys have uh, respiratory therapists that will help out with that? Usually. Usually, exactly. That's usually the case. And so again, it's respiratory therapy dependent. Like we talked about, these patients will have, it's effort dependent. So specifically myasthenics, we probably want to do a couple, but knowing that, of course, fatigable weakness, three in a row, you know, take your best kind of estimate of what their pulmonary function test is. As I also alluded to, if you can get these patients early enough, non-invasive um, treatments are helpful because uh, you know you get them, you end up treating them with um, more peridostigmine or any other sort of immunomodulating therapies like IVIG or plasmapheresis, you can turn them around without needing to intubate them. And so this is the one case that BiPAP can be useful, except we all know BiPAP in general, we worried about aspiration risk, right? And these patients already have oftentimes a lot of bulbar weakness and so you have to weigh that um, in consideration. Okay. And in the third case, one with shortness of breath, back pain, numbness, weakness, and tingling, you guys are probably going down this particular pathway showing that there is a, um, weakness of the arms and legs, more so affecting the legs, as well as there's paresthesias and absent reflexes. So what is this? Gambare, right? We had talked about how um, the one of the questions you guys had asked uh, for this particular case was, was there any preceding illness? And so oftentimes preceded by a viral illness, most commonly on your boards, Campylobacter, diarrheal illness. Um, and so the reason I put this in the um, case intro is that a lot of people with um, Gambare actually present initially with back pain. Okay, and then paresthesia is a major complaint for them, for this polyneuropathy. And so think about how many people you see with neuropathy in the ED. <laughs> and so that's okay, just like a lot of things we do in ED, it's all appropriate, you know, in education and return instructions, right? And so even if they, if you, if they, if you're looking, you're looking back and then you find that, okay, the patient actually had, you know, more than one ED visit and the first one could have been an earlier um, diagnosis of this particular condition, as long as the patient came back appropriately in time, then uh, that's okay. Okay, and so for this, this is also an immune um, polyneuropathy, polyradiculopathy, and the classic on your boards is ascending paralysis, so contrasting that with your botulism, which is descending paralysis, okay? Um, a lot of times preceded by infectious syndrome, like we talked about, and uh, um, depending on how fast they progress, then how severe the disease process is, like I also mentioned, neuropathic pain and dysautonomia are common. To diagnosis, symptoms have to be less than a month because if it has been going on for more than that, it's not an acute process. You worry about other um, demyelinating processes. They have to be hyporeflexic or areflexic, and they need a CSF to diagnose it with the whole albuminal cytologic dissociation. And if you're worried about their respiratory status, we'd already talked about this, the 20, 30, 40 rule. This is the patient who in front of you looks bad or have these numbers that are, you're worried about their pulmonary function, then they need to get intubated. Because this is a disease process that doesn't turn around within hours or days. And so BiPAP in, or non-invasive stuff in this patient population is just not uh, incorrect. Okay. Um, we don't want to give sucks in this particular patient group. I don't know if you guys are a succinylcholine or other uh, neuromuscular blockade um, program. Our program tends to use only non-depolarizing agents. Um, but specifically for this is, again, people tend to present later. Uh, in with Guillain-Barre, and so you do worry about the whole, the fact that you have these um, muscles and uh, synaptic um, junctions that are not being activated. <laughs> 
steroids are not helpful in these patients. Okay. And then finally, how many of you guys have heard of um, emergency neurological life support? Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's something that is relatively newish the last couple of years. The idea is that there's, um, uh, I think now we're up to 15 protocols for neurological emergencies, um, including things like stroke, TBI, et cetera. But acute non traumatic weakness is one of them. Um, a lot of what they recommend is stuff that you guys already know in terms of what to do. But I find two particular things to be helpful um, in these protocols. One separate than obviously a protocolized way to approach these things. One which is kind of a checklist for the first hour. That these are all designed to be how do you take care of a patient within the first hour of a neurological emergency. And then another one is actually a communication checklist, which I find very helpful because those are the exact questions I ask on the line when somebody's calling me for a transfer. Um, and so specific for acute non-traumatic weakness, uh, we already kind of went through this. Obviously, you have to figure out and assess the patient in front of you in terms of the ABCs. You're going to have to characterize the weakness by your detailed exam and based on that try and localize and figure out a differential for that. Uh, in terms of workup, obviously we always want to remember glucose in any neurological complaint because uh, hypoglycemia can present with a focal weakness in a lot of patients. Uh, but other than that, electrolytes right, for people uh, to rule out things like periodic paralysis etc. Uh, and you might even consider things like thyroid function tests testing, um, CKs if you're going down the path of my myopathies, uh, or ESR, etc. for things like dermatomyositis, etc. And then again, w once you figure out what disease, um, um, what area of the motor pathway you're really dealing with, then it helps you figure out which imaging the patient needs, right? Rather than, unfortunately, the pan MRI for the nervous system doesn't exist. Okay. All right, so hopefully that gives you guys a little bit in terms of how to approach these patients, again, um, who can be quite undifferentiated when they first show up in the ED based on the history as well as the physical to break it down. I like to do it by unilateral versus bilateral weakness uh, and specific to neuromuscular uh, respiratory failure that we can see with uh, myasthenia gravis and Guillain-Barre. Pulmonary function testing is helpful for Guillain-Barre, uh, whereas uh, non-invasive uh, ventilation can be helpful in myasthenia. So questions? Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, not specifically. The only thing is that you don't use uh, the succinylcholine. Exactly. Yeah, but not specifically for Guillain-Barre. Correct. Yeah, because you're not dealing with a neuromuscular junction where you're trying to block it for Guillain-Barre. But yes, but for, to recap in terms of I think what you're alluding to, which is for myasthenia, if you're intubating them, if you're using succinylcholine, you need to give more. If you're using anything else, you need to give less. Cool. Yes? Regarding the blood gas spores and the mm -hmm. um, are they typically in a hyperperfect state because they're hypoventilating, or are they like more of a kind of an altitude type state because they're not getting enough oxygen? They're usually compensated um, until, so, so when you do see hypercarbia, it's often too late. Because it, for people with myasthenia that have you know, known diagnoses and they often have a lot of fluctuations in their respiratory status from day to day, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yes? One thing we see a lot is paresthesias. Uh huh. Without other findings. Yeah. Is it nothing? That's worth, true. Worth, you know, working it up, could it be multiple, you know, early sign multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. Give me some, um, you know, recommendations regarding patient coming in with numbness, perhaps one side, you know, both hands, and um, how you work those up. I think again it's doing in terms of paresthesia workup is similar in that you're trying to figure out is this something we're dealing with a, a peripheral nerve like neuropathy are we dealing with something bigger like a plexopathy or, or, or even a, a, a spinal nerve um, radiculopathy 
type of symptoms. And so it, it depends on where you're localized to in terms of how to work it out. But I think they're less emergent in the sense that, of course, without motor dysfunction, that they, you have some leeway in, in um, not having to work it up as thoroughly. But it, it does take um, telling the patient and making sure they have the right follow-up. Yeah, it is tough. The tinglies are the third category of things that we groan when we pick up the <laughs> chart. Awesome, any other questions? Awesome, great, thank you again.